Hey, welcome back. As you know, I have a bit of an obsession with carrying stuff on bikes, but believe it or not, I don't exclusively ride cargo bikes. I also have this one, which is relatively normal, apart from the fact that it doesn't know whether it wants to be a hardtail mountain bike or a city commuter, and looks like I built it to go duck hunting. Obviously, this is a custom build, and I really like this bike, because I can annoy bike nerds by claiming that it's a gravel bike, and because it's very reliable and it can do a little bit of everything. That being said, I've been wanting to put a larger and more sturdy rack on this for some time, so I figured instead of buying another one, I'm gonna try building a bigger and much beefier version of the rack that's currently on there, which is the Pelago Commuter. You can actually buy this rack in a larger size, but I managed to bend this one twice already because I can't be trusted to stick to the recommended load capacity, and apparently these are not made to go down a single trail while carrying a 25 kilo muffler, so I'm gonna make a similar rack but using a different material. Instead of the 10mm aluminum tubing this is made from, I'm gonna use 12mm solid rods, which is surprisingly not as heavy as you think, but should be very robust and is also super easy to work with. I also didn't have a tool for actually bending the stuff, so I looked online and as I said, I just wanna mess around a little bit, so I didn't feel like spending a huge amount on this. And then I saw this bender for 12mm tubes on eBay for just 25 bucks, and I figured even if I break this so it doesn't work out somehow, it's not going to be a huge deal, and without getting too deep into this topic, I think buying cheap tools is actually not a bad idea at all, as long as you have the right expectations. You can always upgrade to a better tool later, but getting the cheap tool first often allows you to gain valuable experience without investing a lot of money up front, and then when you do upgrade, you have a much better idea of what you want or need in a tool, so you can make an informed decision. So this is a handheld bender, and I think this is mostly designed for things like bending copper tubing for doing plumbing on site. It does say it can also bend steel in the box, but it doesn't specify any wall thickness, so it's kind of hard to guess what the actual bending capacity is on this. But needless to say, bending solid stock is not what this is made for, so I bought this fully aware that I'm gonna be misappropriating it and most likely pushing it to its limit. I already know I'm not going to be using this as a handheld device, so for the first test I put the handle in my vise and then inserted a test piece to see if it's able to bend this material. It is a little bit of a struggle, but as you can see it's actually bending this, so this thing is overperforming beyond its rated capacity and also beyond its price tag already. The scale on this is a bit meaningless, so you do have to check the bend angle manually, but it did put a nice clean bend in this, so I think I'll be able to rebuild a rack with this. It's just gonna need a few modifications first. First of all, holding this in the vise like this is not gonna work because if I want to put another bend there, I can't actually position my material because it collides with the vise, since the handle is in the same plane as the bending die, which is not the smartest design, but then again you have to keep in mind this was designed to be handheld. Since I don't need the handle anyway, I figured I'm just gonna remove that and modify the bending die so it can be screwed onto something that I can then hold in the vise. As you can see, there's also a bit of flex here between the bending die and the follower die, and I think I can improve this by using longer screws and putting on a second connecting arm on top as well. So the first thing I'm gonna do is drill out the thread on this brand new tool I just bought, and then put two additional holes to attach this to a block. And I know what some of you are thinking at this point, because as the drill went in, I thought the exact same thing. This was probably a dumb move, because I put those holes way too close to the corner there, which is the point on this that is gonna experience the highest stress when bending. And this thing is cast aluminum, which is known for its brittleness, which is also the reason I can't just weld something onto this. I then also realized I put the hole too close to the center somehow, so I did what any good machinist would do, just turn the hole into a slot and pretend it was on purpose. Then I just made this simple block to screw onto the die, so the handle here is also what attaches this bracket that holds the stock in place. And since I don't need it as a handle and it'll just get in the way, I figured I'll just cut it off and turn it into a screw by grinding some flats on the end. Now we can put this together using longer screws and use the support bracket for the top that I talked about. So let's put my now very Frankenstein looking bender to the test. As you can see it now mounts to the top of the vise without the handle getting into the way.
At first this was looking quite promising, but if you've been itching to scream I told you so, this is your chance because this is what happened next. So the casting broke exactly where I thought it would, which is 100% my fault, so at least I got to tell myself I told you so. But after I managed to stop cursing, I decided not to give up on this thing yet, and this epic fail led me to a much better solution that I could have just used in the first place, but sometimes you gotta have a crappy idea first to get to the good one. And speaking of good ideas, if you care about your online security and privacy, you should check out today's sponsor, Surfshark. At this point, most of you probably know what a VPN is. It's basically a service that routes all your online traffic through encrypted servers of your choice, and that way Surfshark makes it extremely difficult for other people or companies to track your activity online. I've personally been using VPN services for years because there's just so many benefits to it and a Surfshark subscription is super cheap, so it's kind of a no-brainer. Not to mention that it can even save you money. A good example for this is online price discrimination. This is a common practice where online stores will often change their pricing based on which location they think you're in. If you're using a VPN, you can just pick a server in a different area or country and you'd be surprised how often this affects what you're being shown online. Here's another example. When I do research for a project, one thing that really annoys me is that many search engines will actually show you completely different results based on your country, no matter which location you set in your profile. Many websites even offer you different features based on your location, which is something you can easily get around with the VPN. There's many other benefits to a Surfshark subscription besides just the VPN though. For example, you can choose to be notified if your personal data has been leaked in any data breaches, or generate fake email addresses to avoid getting spam mail. They also offer a 30-day money-back guarantee, and if you use the code Vandalay, you can even get an extra 4 months completely for free right now. So go ahead and check the link in the description where you can get started in just a few minutes. And now let's get back to the video. Yeah, let's just grind that surface flat so it looks like I totally cut that off on purpose. That's much better. I'm now going to mount the whole thing to that steel plate I just drilled a hole into. So I'm just going to weld this onto the plate here to create a stop for the die. And then there will be another smaller one on this side to prevent it from rotating the other way. And it looks like the bender is actually working great now. For some reason adding the support bracket on top actually makes it work worse, so maybe it needs a little bit of slop, but the bottom line is the tool works now, so I can finally start making the actual rack. As always, planning this infusion beforehand was a huge help. It only took me like 30 minutes to build this model, and this takes a lot of the guesswork out of the bending, because using the measuring tools I can figure out the exact distance between the bends without doing any math, which believe it or not is something my brain sucks at. So all I did then was to mark the start point and end point of each bend on my material. So this S marks the start of the first bend, then the next mark is where that bend should end, and then the V is for the vertical bends, which I'm going to do in a later step, and then comes the next corner bend, and so on and so forth. I'm not very experienced in this whole bending business, so I had no idea if this would work, which is why I'm building a rack out of cheap materials, which doesn't carry a huge penalty if I mess up. I was pleasantly surprised that this seems to work out perfectly, because the end point I marked actually did end up exactly at the 90 degree mark. The material does tend to get pulled out of the clamping bracket a little bit, but that turned out not to be a problem. I did overshoot this bend slightly, but luckily with this material, if it's just a few degrees, it's quite easy to correct it by just bending it back slightly by hand. So let's do the next bends. Of course I gotta watch out for the bends to actually stay in the same plane, so I put a spacer on the vise here to keep it level. The next bend is what gets interesting, because if this isn't exactly in the correct location, the ends are not gonna match up. And that's what's kind of nerve wracking about bending stuff. If you mess up the last bend on a workpiece like this, the entire thing becomes trashed instantly, and you gotta start over, so it's a little anxiety inducing, which is probably why I tend to avoid it. Bending somehow just doesn't feel as predictable as machining to me, but that's probably got a lot to do with the lack of skill. That being said, this project might have changed my mind, because clueless as I am, it came out way nicer than I expected. Everything is pretty close to square, considering my methods, and as I said, it is possible to do small corrections by hand, 
So after triple checking all the angles, I then cut off the excess. And as you can see, the ends are actually matching up perfectly. And once they're connected, this should be a pretty decent rectangle. It's not done yet though, I still have to put the vertical bands in it, which provides new opportunities for messing things up. And sure enough, I did run into a problem. As you can see here, the follower die actually collides with the existing band there. This is something I didn't anticipate when planning this, but I think it's fixable with yet another modification to the bender. For bending solid material, you don't necessarily need that form-fitting follower die, which would normally prevent tubing from getting flattened, which this can't since it's not hollow. So I just made the cylinder on the lathe from some POM, which is a machinable plastic. So let's try that instead and do another bend test. At this point I admit it's kind of ridiculous how little is actually left of the original bending tool. And since the handle was attached to the former following die, I also had to use some pliers to drive this. But the funniest part is that this setup not only fixed my clearance issue, but the whole thing worked way better than before in general. So now I can finish that bend in the rack and then I have to do the same thing on the other side which presented a new issue since the rack now collides with the vise. So I have to mount it in a different position and it turned out to be really tricky to find one that gives me enough clearance. So eventually I ended up with this viseception setup. I can't even count the amount of improvising that's included in this shot but this setup did allow me to finish the last bend. And despite a small misalignment on the end, it came out pretty good. So I'm twisting the ends a little bit here to make them match up again. And then it's finally time to attach them together. So I'm also filing a chamfer on there to hopefully get a bit better penetration. And speaking of penetration, since I had two scraps laying around from the same material from the bend test, I figured I'm just gonna weld those together because I kinda want to see how strong this connection is. As you can see, there's no signs of the wad wanting to crack or break here, and I also put the connection at the least important part of the rack, so I think this is a very viable solution. After welding the ends together, I'm of course going to flatten the wall to make it look like one piece, starting by filing off the bulk of it and then using strips of sandpaper and finally some scotch bright to blend everything in. So far I think this is looking really clean, so next up is putting in these crossbars. I'm using some 1-2-3 blocks as spacers here because they happen to be the right length and then just sandwiching this between two stops for a nice simple setup that keeps everything straight. It's also still looking pretty flat, so let's weld this up. One thing I underestimated about this build is how annoying it is to weld really small diameter round stock like this. It's kind of difficult to run a long consistent bead on these because I had to keep moving around to get a good torch position and to reach every joint from all sides. But on the other hand, it's nice to weld solid material because you know you can't really burn through anything. There's just a few pieces missing now on the rack. One is this bridge piece that the mounting bracket will attach to. I didn't have a piece of flat bar the right size, so I just used a bigger one and cut it in half. And in my last video I talked a bit about modifications I made for my bandsaw. So here's one I didn't show you, which is this big table that mounts to the custom base I built for the saw. It only takes a second to install this and it converts it to a slightly more capable vertical bandsaw. I also made this fence for it. It's not super elaborate for my standards and just mounts with a clamp, but it works well enough for this kind of thing. Now these both get cut to size a little bit and the short one gets a slot milled into it with a nice chamfer.
With this welded on, there's only one thing missing on the rack itself now, which is a bunch of little tabs. So I cut these from some flat bar and now I'm clamping them together to grind them all to the same length. Then they go on the mill to get a miter and a mounting thread. And keeping them sandwiched like this amounts to three times less work, which is why I try doing that whenever possible. Here's the finished brackets. Two of these will connect the rack to the low rider mounts on the fork and the third one is to mount the front light. So let's roll these on and finish up the rack. Next I need to make a bracket like this. This is from another board rack. And instead of doing a lot of measuring, I'm just going to copy this shape, which is designed so that the bracket can clear different rim breaks. I don't have a dedicated bending tool for this kind of thing, so I'm just going to use the hydraulic press and this V-block with a piece of flat bar, which worked out pretty well. I did a little cleanup on this part afterwards and now this gets a few holes. I'll put a slot on this side for some adjustability and yes it would have been smarter to do this before bending it because it's a bit awkward to hold in the vise now. And I'm also once again committing the sin of milling with the drill chuck which I know triggers the hell out of some people which kind of makes me want to do it even more. But joking aside I would consider this very light milling so in my experience it's totally fine and I'm just too lazy to switch to a collet chuck. Let's mount this to the rack now and then I'm going to do a test install to figure out how long I have to make the stays that go on the fork. Those stays will be custom made for this bike, so if I ever want to put this on a different bike I might have to make new ones. But this way it's also simpler, lighter and much cleaner than the adjustable stays or the massive adapters you often find with board racks that have to work with a wide variety of bikes. These are made from the same materials as the rest of the rack and having these be solid makes the process really simple since I don't have to weld on any tabs. I'm just gonna mill some flats on the ends and then drill straight through. As always I did some cleanup and here's what they look like now. The fit seems really good too, so with that the rack is actually finished. And while I do think this looks really cool just raw like this, for this particular bike I think a black one is just gonna fit the whole look a lot better, so I'm gonna be painting this. Since these racks get quite beat up, I want to do this properly, so I'm sandblasting all the parts first to create a nice, even rough surface for the primer to stick to. Afterwards everything gets cleaned and degreased and then coated with a special aluminum primer, which I found is kind of a must-have for aluminum, because it's a pretty tricky material to paint and standard primer tends to not get enough adhesion. Afterwards the primer gets wet sanded slightly with a fine grit to smooth things out and make the next layer stick better. And then I did two coats of matte black 2K paint and I think the result looks super nice. We'll see how long the paint actually lasts but so far it seems to be pretty durable. Since this question always comes up I also weighed the whole thing and the entire rack including the mounting hardware comes in at 776 grams. Which seems pretty reasonable considering how big and sturdy this thing is. So let's mount this to the bike now. Another thing I think people are gonna ask about is the paint job on this frame. As you might have guessed this is a custom paint job I did which was actually a result of fixing another botched custom paint job. I guess Bob Ross would call it a happy little accident and I actually thought about making a video about painting bikes at some point since I've done quite a bit of that recently so let me know if you'd be interested in seeing that. 
One thing I like about my rack compared to the Pelago I showed you in the beginning is that this has threads in all the brackets, so you don't need to use any tiny nuts, which makes installation a lot more convenient. Last but not least, let's install the front light. This is a Busch & Müller IQX, which is one of the best bike dynamo lights out there in my opinion. And this bracket is specifically positioned to fit this particular light perfectly without any additional mounting hardware. You sometimes see people mounting lights on the side or the front of these racks, but I think this position here is a lot better. Because this light costs 100 euros and you really don't want the person next to you on the bike rack to crash their bike into it. So down here it's well protected from all sides. And with that we're done with this project. I'm super happy with how this came out, especially considering I used the cheapest tool possible. And I learned some valuable things in the process, so there's a good chance I'll dive deeper into this topic in the future and maybe make some more racks from different materials. There is a reasoning for the size of this by the way. I think this is the perfect trade-off between a rack that can carry a decent amount of stuff without making the front of the bike too bulky. Wider racks often get really annoying when you want to lean the bike against something or put it into a bike rack. So this is a footprint small enough to avoid those issues, but big enough to install something like a large basket or carry a medium sized bag. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed this video even if you're not a bike nerd, and let me know in the comments if you're interested in more bike accessory builds, because I have quite a few other ideas. Thanks for watching and see you next time.